Hello, and welcome to the next episode of FedRAMP, the other F word. As usual, I'm your host and moderator, Michael McPherson, representing MJM and Earthling Security. To my right, I have one of the foremost voices in the regulatory compliance world. I'll let him introduce himself, Joshua Marpet. Hi, Josh Marpet uh, with MJM Growth and Earthling Security. Uh, I do a lot of different things in InfoSec, IT, infrastructure, security, compliance, standards authorship, pretty much you name it. I have a lot, way too much fun for my own good. Okay, and barking there in the background, better watch it or she'll give you the horns there. We have <laughs> Babby from MindPoint Group. Absolutely incredible mind and one of the one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Gabby, can you give us a quick introduction here? Thank you. Good morning. Way too kind. Gabriella Smith Sherman here. I am the director of governance risk compliance for MindPoint Group. Uh, I am a former Fed. I had the opportunity to serve as a CISO and many other roles, but primarily my bread and butter has always been GRC, which I love. I put the G in governance risk and compliance. So looking forward to chatting with you all today. All right. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Uh, thank you, Josh. So <clears throat> we're going to be discussing Rev Five today. And first, I want to I want to take a couple of moments, and uh, I'll throw this one to start off to Gabby here. Uh, what is what is the impetus for for Rev Five? Why why did we need to come up with a a new revision to the rules, so to speak? What what led us here? So, I mean, anyone who has been following NIST over the years, we have evolved over time, right? I think when I first joined cybersecurity and started learning about the RMF, we were at Rev2. Um, and over time, uh, many controls have changed. Requirements have changed. OMB mandates have changed. Executive orders have changed. And as our threat actors and those who are looking to cause malicious intent to the federal government um, and many of our other kind of supporting organizations that leverage this framework, we have adopted those brand new mechanisms that allow us to focus on specific security controls that are going to protect our systems, our data and our personnel. That's really the impetus, right? Um, recently, the executive order was released. We have had uh, several kind of reasons to double down on policy related to multi-factor authentication. Come on, this has been out for, I don't know how many years, 2010, 2014 now. Um, most people do not implement it at all in transit, right? Making sure that they're focusing on what actually needs to happen. This is not a new requirement. We're just reinforcing requirements that we know are broken um, and really need to modernize or, uh, organizational security as well as our physical and cybersecurity. With the shift in modernization um, from going to from traditional kind of on-prem and moving to the cloud, we have to think about these things and mechanisms where we are inheriting security controls from other organizations or CSPs. Um, cloud service providers for those of you who are not aware of what a CSP is. So that's really the intent of really kind of focusing on these critical controls that we know are much needed for our systems to be protected. So to be clear, things change. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and, and as these things change, Josh, you've been, uh, you know, sort of in the regulatory compliance authorship and standards authorship for quite some time. Yeah. What's the process to go into a, a new revision, what's what's required to get us there? And then let's talk Oof. about where we actually got. So typically, and, and NIST, is, and NIST is, as Gabby mentioned, is one of the big organizations that do this, but there's others. There's ISO, there's there, there's dozens of standards organizations out there and accreditation organizations. But they're, they're, all of their experiences are fairly similar. They go, okay, something's different, something's changed. Somebody goes, hey, uh, look, there's containers now. Uh, you know, ransomware is more prevalent than ever before. We have this thing called supply chains. Ooh. You know, whatever. So uh, people raise concerns. Those concerns are raised in forums. Those concerns are raised in, in conferences. Those concerns are raised at various places. The organization takes note of those concerns, realizes, okay, it's been like seven years. We should probably update things. Uh, let's take a look at this and see, does it make sense to do a, a like a hot fix or a full you know, revision update? And that when they go, okay, it's time for a full revision update, they, they have a panel a, a task force, a work group that, that writes it out, then it goes out for internal comment, then it goes out for public comment, then they rewrite it every time, uh, revise it. Somebody goes, you didn't go far enough. You, got, you went way too far. What the hell were you thinking? Trust Addressing me, all of your feedback. Goodness, so many things come into play with it. it. It is not an easy process. 
I definitely would say the poor people at NIST and all of these other frameworks, they have a huge job. There's no way that they can make us all happy, right? That's totally impossible. There's no way that they can think of every situation that would identify specific requirements. This is a yep. best practice. Most people tend to forget that this NIST is listed as guidance for us to implement, right? So that you have a framework and some, some form or fashion of information that's going to allow you to carve out the policies at your organizationally defined parameters. And it is a huge uplift. Not only does it take us time to get through the 53 revision, but then we also have to go through the process of the 53A, right, which is going to really tell us how do we assess against each of those controls as an accompanying document and going through that same iterative process. It is very time consuming. Um, and then also kind of taking into consideration what are some of those top trends that we need to start incorporating into our business process, such as supply chain, right, focusing on privacy and that integration. Privacy has been something that's kind of been riding in the sidecar next to cybersecurity for quite some time. Yeah. It has been a supporting appendix of the program, right? You are supposed to think about it for your PTAs, your privacy threshold analysis, privacy impact analysis, your SORNs, right? Your systems of records um, and notification process and making sure that all of that PII is documented, publicly available and posted um, as far as the type of data that is being collected for your systems and how we are protecting those specific mechanisms. Getting all of that stuff integrated into something like Rev5 is a huge undertaking. So I do want people to recognize that while it, it does take a lot of time for us to get through this process and work through those kinks, respect how much work goes into it. And what does that mean for us? It means a lot of work. Josh, let's talk about some of the work and what that really means for all of our poor people that are responsible for implementing these controls, um, documenting, and then assessing, right? There is a huge lift that goes into that. Uh, there's a monstrous lift. There's a monstrous lift. I mean, look, l let's assume you've got five controls, just, just five, okay? And now those controls have changed. So what do you have to do? You have to reassess every single control, all five. Oh my gosh, five controls. And in, that, in reality, there's, there's a hell of a lot more than five. Goodness. Um, but for just five controls, and I'm just picking this at random, you have to reassess every single thing you've done. You have to reassess whether your, your, your process works within the scope of the control. You have to reassess the scope of the control. You have to reassess whether the artifacts that you're creating have adequacy and sufficiency to meet the needs of the auditor that's going to come by at some point, whether it's this year, next year, three years from now, whatever. You have to assess whether what you're doing is right and proper and whether what you're producing is right and proper and, and, and handling it to the spirit and letter of the controls. Now, that's for five controls. That's just your passwords, for example. Okay. Now do it for everything you do. And it's, it's hard. It's hard. So it, it, it's really tough to understand that the, not just the, the, the wording changes, but the work changes so significantly that when we have this kind of revision, they almost always, by the way, the last aspect of what changes or how does it change is that they say, okay, we've got the final version, the final draft, the final everything, it's all done. We're going to put it in place on, let's say, January 1st. It doesn't go into force for typically a year or two later because they need to give you time to actually make the changes, to do the assessment, to do all the pieces that you need to do to actually get up to, up to par. And it's really, really difficult. This is not an easy thing. Um, this is something that is, uh, it's equivalent an effort to your original uh, uh, assessment and your original uh, audit, your original, you know, getting certified. And if you have to, if you have to do that, this is a significant investment in time, effort, potentially not just in your GRC group, your compliance group, it's potentially a significant effort in your infrastructure group, your coding group, your, your identity and access management group, your, well, you get the idea, okay? So at the, when changes like this are made, there is a significant impact. Now, like I said, they, they roll this over a year or two, okay? This time I think it's a year. So uh, that impact is slowed in that you can run it over time. It's almost like a mortgage. You're amortizing that effort over time but it's not small. It's not small. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So let's talk about the impact between whether you are attempting to get FedRAMP for the first time or whether you're already FedRAMP. Who is this impacting more and where do those changes lie? Okay. If you're already in the process, I've already got 
a, a, a three pal working with me, who are already in the process of, of, of assessing everything I do. And you were doing this under the auspices of Rev4, okay? So you're already in the process, you're already registered that you are, you are FedRAMP ready, and I've got the three pal over here, and they're working with me to go through all the, the controls and all the evidence. You can stick with Rev4, you're fine, okay? If you were not already engaged with the three pal, my understanding is that if you don't, even if you're FedRAMP ready, but you haven't engaged with a 3 pow to come in and start the assessment, sorry, you've got to move to Rev5. Okay, so there's the difference. If you have a 3 pow, uh, obviously, if you're already ATO'd, you're done. Okay, ATO authorization to operate. If you're already ATO'd, if you're already operating, if you're already running, you're, and you're at Rev4, you're at Rev4 until the next time. Okay, if you're engaged and have a, if you have a 3 pow engaged, and you're doing it Rev4, stay with Rev4, you're fine. They're not going to make you switch midstream, basically. But if you haven't started, you better start reading Rev5. All right. Well, I just want to thank everybody for stopping in and watching this. Joshua and Gabrielle, thank you as well. Uh, please drop any questions in the comments here, and we'll make sure to get to them next time. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, take care.